Um, anything to add, Deborah? Well, Joseph, I'd, I'd say that uh, I echo John's re reluctance to fully embrace the idea of an institutionalized movement, even no. from the non-state perspective, because we find that increasingly because of legal, financial uh, pressures, institutionalized uh, uh, freedom of information groups become quite uh, obdurate, uh, uh, inflexible, not agile, not tactical enough. They become uh, quite limited by uh, the institutional apparatus as, as, as uh, corporate or institutional uh, rules or nonprofit rules, taxation rules require control their behavior. So we prefer being independent agents. We prefer that agility. We prefer that daily uh, uh, lack of master plan uh, agitation and not being limited by the annual report obligations upon freedom of information nonprofits. We have no annual report. So in terms of our own particular uh, agility, I'd say that uh, it, it's ironic that Cryptome is considered as a, an underground project uh, because as John's mentioned, he and I are both licensed architects practicing in New York City as our base. And our work increasingly does take us to underground sites, in fact. And these are either small utility bolts between sidewalks or larger subway system expansion projects. And so our practice in these underground sites is linked with, well, cultures of repair which expose urban infrastructures here in New York City as, you know, the bundling of old and new technologies that you find every time you open up the street. And so because we're called into urban infrastructures at moments of um, these moments of crisis and disrepair, if you will, uh, you could say we're involved in radical cultures of repair. And I will link that to freedom of information. This seems like a stretch, but bear with me, Joseph, because I'll eventually get there. So you could say that we're involved in these radical cultures of repair because these crises and collapses in New York City and other large urban centers expose the politics of urban technologies, including information technologies, that are, you know, heightened by the status of New York City as a global city. That's New York City as a node tightly bundled global systems, uh, a nexus of technologies, finance, transportation, communication power that are, you know, at the heart of global wealth production. So during these times of infrastructure crisis, states of emergency are called, and these states of emergency suspend many democratic procedures. And so as architects who work in the underground, we encounter these very politically volatile uh, moments for, for democracy. Uh, and so uh, since 9-11, of course, urban infrastructures have been privileged as uh, under the domain of critical infrastructures. And you're no doubt familiar with the Critical Infrastructure Protection Program. And we're very concerned as architects about this uh, regime of critical infrastructure protection because with it has come uh, uh, policing innovations that uh, are uh, very chilling to democratic uh, processes. We've got uh, uh, the policing of dissent uh, by a NYP, the New York Police Department, which has instituted next generation command and control technologies their infamous domain awareness system that we've brought, brought to people's control. They've got a mini-me CIA intelligence division embedded in NYPD that's the most powerful, secretive, and well-funded in, in the country, is the gold standard, it's called. And so they, the undercover infiltration and surveillance of various ethnicities and dissenting groups is a, uh, a problem uh, uh, during the, the state of emergency. So let me just... I'll conclude here by coming back to our mandate as architects, which really underpins our freedom of information approach, and that is 
We are required by state law as architects to police issues of public health, safety, and welfare. This is in the name of public good or the, in the name of the commonweal. And so from Pricknell's perspective, we are obliged as architects to police the police, if you will. We are obliged to dissent as required for the public good. And so our advocacy of a robust public domain, which is our information, uh, uh, our emancipation of information towards the public domain, goes against the continuum in New York City and elsewhere around the world that ranges from these regimes of secrecy, privatization, intellectual property that are about, you know, power and wealth reduction, not uh, for the public good as claimed by the, the authorities. So uh, our freedom of information is intimately tied to cultures of repair and opening up repairs through maintenance, uh, prevention towards uh, repairs of the public domain, if you will. So Cryptome has a daily project of methodical daily work and updates. Nothing dramatic, not involved with the spectacle of crisis, which is a big fundraiser, the biggest fundraiser out there. We just methodically do our architectural work of, of keeping the public domain in good repair, including information infrastructures. So when you talk about the movement, we are moving, we hope, perhaps not in concert with, with the, the, the great train of elephants of, of, of uh, restrictive nonprofit freedom of information groups that are constrained by their lawyers and their boards of directors and their tax obligations. So we are part of this flow, but uh, we're, uh, you know, we're not uh, limited by it.